practices. You got to understand occlusion. Occlusion is the foundation of all of it. Our, my whole practice is based on occlusion because I can't increase vertical dimension and do a full mouth reconstruction on a patient if I don't, if I'm not an expert in occlusion and the differential diagnosis of facial pain. I'm going to talk with you about the fundamentals of occlusion. Then we're going to progress in forthcoming dental minutes to the differential diagnosis and treatment of facial pain, i.e. myofascial pain or muscle pain and intraarticular or TMJ pain. But today we're only talking about occlusion. I'm going to make this so interesting for you that you're going to find occlusion fascinating. First of all, we need to go through some basic concepts. Centric relation is the relationship of the mandible to the maxilla when the properly aligned condyle disc assemblies are in the most superior position against the immunitia, irrespective of tooth position or vertical dimension. All that means is centric relation only has to do with joint position in the fossa, in the socket. The easy way to think of it it's when the condyle is maximally seated. Now it doesn't have anything to do with the biting of the teeth. It only has to do with the condyle maximally, most stably seated in the fossa. Its centriculation is not an area, it's a dot. If you have multiple dentists that understand how to manipulate into centric relation, which is what I'm gonna show you in a moment, every one of them will manipulate into the exact same position. So it's a dot. It's not a range. It's a dot. And you can come back to it time and time and time again. So that's one of the reasons it's a fundamental for complex restoration. Occlusion is no different than the foundation of a house. You wouldn't want to rebuild or build a house on a bad foundation. You wouldn't want to remodel a house on a bad foundation. You want to set the foundation first. So that's what occlusion is. And this is centric relation. The condyle is maximally seated in the fossa. It has nothing to do with tooth position. Centric occlusion has nothing to do with condylar position. It only has to do with tooth position. Centric occlusion is a relationship of the mandible to the maxilla when the teeth are in maximum occlusal contact irrespective of the position or alignment of the condyle disc assemblies. I mean, forget about the condyle when you're talking about centric occlusion. A centric occlusion is just bite, bite down, bite together. This is also referred to as the acquired position of the mandible. Sometimes people, especially if they have a class two occlusion, will position their teeth so it looks like they've got a normal skeletal alignment. So that's centric occlusion. It could be anywhere, but it's the maximum. It's when the teeth are in maximum contact. So our objective is centric relation occlusion. We want the teeth to contact maximally and stably when the condyle is maximally seated in the fossa. Now let me go through that again. When I put, when I manipulate the condyle into the most stable position in the fossa, this is a simplified version of centric relation occlusion. When I manipulate the condyle into the most stable, maximally seated position of the fossa here. This is centric relation. And if the teeth are also in maximum contact, it doesn't mean every tooth has to contact. It means enough teeth on either side should contact at precisely the same time when the condyle is seated in centric relation that the bite is stable. I'm going to talk about the occlusal part in just a moment. But if you can picture a table in a restaurant that has 10 legs, for that table to be stable, how many of those legs have to contact at precisely the same time? Well, probably four. If the four corner legs contact at precisely the same time, so long as the other legs don't contact at all or contact at the same time, that's a stable table. Now what if one of the legs in the middle of the table contacts first, or that's the longest leg, then that table is going to pivot. 
What do you do in that case? You either shave a little bit off of that leg or you take some uh, sugar packets and put them under some of the other legs so the table doesn't rock. That's why they call it the occlusal table. You've got to have enough teeth contacting on each side at the exact same moment with the condyle seated maximally in the fossa so that the bite doesn't torque or shift so that it's stable. Now obviously the more teeth you can have contacting the better. So centric relation only has to do with the condyle seated maximally in the fossa. Centric occlusion you're only talking about teeth biting together in their most stable position irrespective of where the condyle is. So what we want in ideal occlusion is for the condyle to be seated at the same time the teeth come into maximum contact, centric relation occlusion. Muscles that play a part of this, the master and the temporalis muscle. And these are the big muscles of closing along with the medial pterygoid. They clench the teeth together. The lateral pterygoid is this little positioning muscle right here that helps position the condyle. When the patient's closing, it's like somebody holding a rope while somebody's going down a cliff with the person going down the cliff being the condyle and the lateral pterygoid would be the rope. It helps position the condyle and the disc. Remember this, this is one of the key studies of all time in relation to occlusion done by Williamson and Lundquist in 1983. Only when posterior disclusion is obtained by an appropriate anterior guidance can the elevating activity of the temporal and master muscles be reduced. What does that mean? Well, a highly intelligent gentleman named Bill Bryant once changed my life because I was giving a seminar on occlusion and I was about 30 years old and Bill was about 75 and he was following me. And so I gave this seminar on, on occlusion like I'm about to talk to you. Uh, but when I got through, Bill got up and said, let's talk about anterior guidance. And he said, what is anterior guidance? Well, like you right now, I thought at the time anterior guidance was the anterior teeth contacting when the mandible moves into eccentric movements. Like if you go left side working, the anterior guidance ideally would be on the cuspid and the anterior teeth. If you go into right side working, the anterior guidance or the tooth contact would be on the right cuspid and the right anterior teeth. When you move into protrusive, ideally, the anterior guidance would be on the central incisors, maybe the cuspid teeth. Well, here's the question Bill posed. He said, what if you don't have, what if the patient had no teeth except one upper left second molar tooth? Where is his anterior guidance? And it just shook me because I thought the anterior guidance is on that second molar tooth contacting the lower gum tissue. Wherever he moves, unless he moved off of that tooth, that's his anterior guidance. What if somebody doesn't have any, any teeth at all, or they've just got posterior teeth in their anterior guidance is on those two. So it's on the molar teeth. So anterior guidance is the most anterior tooth contacting in any movement of the mandible. Ideally, anterior guidance is on the anterior teeth, cuspid to cuspid. The reason for that is because of this study. When you look at these muscles, master temporalis medial pterygoid, the teeth that are contacting at any time signal the muscle fibers of these muscles. Meaning, if all the teeth are contacting, if you put food in your mouth and you're gnashing it with your back teeth, your posterior teeth, all the muscle fibers of the medial pterygoid, the temporalis, and the master muscles are firing because they're in work mode, they're in plow horse mode. The signals are crush, kill, grind that food up. On the other hand, if only the anterior teeth are contacting, that's a very dainty bite. And the signals are be dainty, be light. And so 80% of these muscle fibers will not fire. Only about 10 to 20% of the muscle fibers fire when 
only the anterior teeth are contacting, such as when you're incising something, and there's no food between the posterior teeth. That's why a patient tends to break teeth when they're biting on things with their posterior teeth because all the muscle fibers are firing. So what does that mean? That means if I'm giving a patient a night guard, I only want the anterior teeth to contact. Now, it's important they only wear the night guard for about eight hours because teeth will start to shift if they're not in contact. But if only the anterior teeth are contacting on that night guard, only about 10 to 15 percent of the muscle fibers are firing when they grind and brux their teeth at night. So it takes 80 percent of the stress off the system. You can't make someone stop grinding. All you can do is diminish the stress on the system and you do that by only having the anterior teeth contact. So this is a very important study. Now let's talk about how you manipulate the mandible or the condyle into centric relation. First of all, have the patient raise their chin. They lay back and they raise their chin, get the chin off the neck. The master, these are the master and medial pterygoid muscles right here, and they're represented by your fingertips. So the fingertips go on the bottom of the mandible like this. Just the fingertips, like a ballet dancer. And these represent the master muscle, the temporalis, and the medial pterygoid. Now the thumbs represent the digastric muscles. And you should make a hard C when you're manipulating endocentric relation with the pointer finger and the thumb. This should be a hard C, like that. But you're up, your wrists are up, the fingertips on the inferior board of the mandible and your finger, your thumbs are almost touching on the chin. And you've got a, a very precise locked hold right there. So with the patient's chin up, the head, and you want to brace the head against your stomach like this. You don't want it out here in space. You want it braced against your stomach with the chin up. So the first thing you want to do is just put your fingertips on the inferior board of the mandible and pull the teeth together into centric occlusion. And you want to just spread the fingers out across the inferior board of the mandible. Don't put the thumbs on yet. And then pull the patient's mandible towards your stomach with the fingertips with the teeth in man maximum intercuspation. So pull them together like that with just the fingertips, okay? Next, raise your wrist and put your thumbs on the patient's chin forming a C. And ask the patient to gently open their mouth while you continue to firmly rotate the patient's condyle into the fossa like this. The movement is like this. But get the patient to gently open their mouth. Keep your wrists and elbows locked, your elbows in close to your sides, and hinge your arm from the shoulders. See, I'm locking, but I'm putting this kind of pressure on the condyles. I'm seating the condyles as the patient opens their mouth. Ask the patient to move their mandible open or close very slowly. Don't you open the mouth wide or rapidly hinge the mandible. If you do, you'll make them splint. All right, so I've got the head into my stomach, the chin up, and I'm gonna ask them to open, and I'm just gonna shake it right there, but I'm not going to do this. If you do this, you'll make the muscle splint, especially if they've got a premature contact, i.e. a bad bite. So just shake it real gently, and that confirms that the condyle is in centric relation. Then sustain firm pressure on the inferior border of the mandible with your fingertips in line with the master muscle. So I'm holding this C. The only place you can hinge the mandible is when the condyle is in centric relation. If it's out of the condyle, you can't hinge right there. It's got to be bone braced for you to hinge it. So when I just shake it just a little bit, that's confirming that the condyle is maximally seated, stably, bone braced in the fossa. Sustain only enough pressure with your thumbs to disclude the teeth. This pressure, should be, this pressure should be applied toward the patient's toes. So I'm pushing this way, representing the digastric muscles, and these fingertips are representing the master, medial pterygoid, and temporalis. So you've got an iron grip right here, 
and you're rotating up and then just shaking the mandible like that, okay? Gently and slowly hinge the patient's mandible at five to 10 millimeters of opening. So remember, we're starting with the teeth closed together. This will really help you if you start with their teeth closed together. Now here's where most of you are gonna mess up. You're gonna open the patient and you're gonna, you're gonna manipulate the mandible in a big motion like this and those muscles are gonna lock and you're gonna say, oh my gosh, this doesn't work. It works, you're screwing up. Close the patient together to start with then ask them to open. When they open at five or 10 millimeters, just barely shake the mandible in with the condyle seated maximally in the fossa to confirm your in centric relation because you can only hinge, remember, when the condyle is bone braced in the fossa. So I'm just shaking, just like that, just barely shaking, okay? Then I'll have them open a little bit wider. You don't really want them to, to translate, you want them just to rotate in the conda, in the fossa. Remember, if you open the mandible very wide, it will translate and can't hinge. So it only rotates for about the first 15 millimeters of opening. Then it's going to translate. The condyle is going to translate down the eminence after about 15 millimeters. So forget about hinging at that point. You want to keep it in that 15 millimeter range. Now I'm going to heat some compound to about 135 or 40 degrees and I'm going to roll it up in a ball and I'm going to put it between the central incisors. Then I'm going to very gently manipulate the mandible until the central incisors close into that compound. Now pretend I'm making a night guard. I'm going to take the occlusal registration record at the open vertical dimension of the thickness of the night guard. The, the, the opening, when I touch, I'm gonna to look at the second molar teeth if I'm making a night, fabricating a night guard, and I'm gonna be sure there's two millimeters of space between the second molars as I gently close the patient into that compound in centric relation. Now the teeth are not gonna to come together. The bite is gonna be open, the vertical dimension needed for the thickness of the night guard. So that's how far I'm gonna close into that compound. Then I'm gonna spray it with some air and have it set up right there. So now I've created a deprogrammer. This is a very interesting experiment. If the patient is real tight and hard to manipulate because they've got a malocclusion and they're grinding on a malocclusion, It'd be like running on a leg shorter than the other. The muscles would splint to protect the joints. So if a patient is real tight and you create this compound deprogrammer, which means when they bite into that compound deprogrammer, the condyles are perfectly seated within a very short period of time. The patient will go from to just loose as can be. The muscles will stop splinting as the lower teeth tap in to that compound, which perfectly positions the patient's condyle into centric relation. And so at this open vertical dimension with the compound in place, I'm gonna squirt blue mousse fast set polyvinyl siloxane between the posterior te teeth. Then I'm gonna close back into the compound between the set compound between the front teeth and let that bite registration set up. So here's my clues registration record at an open vertical for fabrication of a night guard or an occlusal orthotic appliance. Because remember, if you just hand articulate a bite or study models, and then you open them on the articulator to fabricate a night guard, only the posterior teeth will contact on the night guard or the uh, occlusal orthotic appliance. You have to take the occlusal registration record at an open bite and record that open bite if you're fabricating a night guard on a, or an occlusal orthotic appliance. If you just open it on the articulator and you fabricate the night guard or the occlusal orthotic appliance and you go to the mouth, only the posterior teeth will contact and you'll have to do a lot of adjustment. This way you'll have very little if any adjustment. Now be sure you trim the bite record so you don't have these big sides. You just want the cuss tips on the bite record. Then you're going to take a face bow, mount the upper model with the face bow, and remember with the face bow this bar 
should be parallel to the pupillary line, not the wax bite, but the bar. The wax bite could be anywhere depending on the occlusal and the incisal plane, but that bar should be parallel to the pupillary line, which represents the tabletop or the floor. Once you've mounted the upper model with the face bow and you set the articulator on the tabletop or the lab bench, the incisal plane should be the same as the incisal plane in the patient's mouth when she's sitting up or their lips apart. Because if her incisal plane goes like this, then when you mount that model on the articulator, it also should be set like this. If her incisal plane is straight, then this incisal plane should be straight. In other words, this is a representation of the patient's maxillary teeth, of the orientation of their maxillary teeth in space. Then you place the occlusal registration record on the upper teeth and then mount the lower model to that occlusal registration record. You've already mounted the upper model on the articulator. Now you're, you're seating the lower model to that with this occlusal registration record. And you can see how I've trimmed the model. So only the cuss tips, I mean, I've trimmed the, the bite record. So only the cuss tips are in the occlusal registration record. If you've got the sides on the record, the bite will be too open. It won't be accurate. You've got to trim it back where you just have the cuss tips. Then you're going to loot that together, then mount it. So if you've, if you've taken a correct centric relation record, this is not a centric occlusion record, it's a centric relation record at an open vertical dimension to make room for an appliance, either a night guard or an occlusal orthotic appliance. If you check the occlusion on your mounted study models, the first contact in centric relation on the stone model should be the first contact in centric relation when you tap the teeth together with the condyle seated in the patient's mouth. So this is the first tooth that contacted on the model and that's the tooth that contacted in the patient's mouth when I place the condyles in centric relation and then touch the teeth together very gent gently. That was the first tooth that contacted. So now let's talk for a moment about occlusion. We've talked about centric relation and centric occlusion. What is occlusion? What is a good occlusion? Occlusion is so simple if you understand it. Picture a patient with one leg shorter than the other. Occlusion is really a very little consequence unless you put stress on the system, just like that short leg. If that person with the short leg sat in a chair all day, they walked to their truck, drove home, had dinner, went to bed, drove to work the next day, walked a short distance while they were at work, the short leg is probably not going to be a big deal because they're not putting much stress on the system. On the other hand, if the person with the short leg jog three to four miles a day on that short leg, what's going to happen? The first thing that's going to happen is the muscles are going to get real tight because they're, and they're splinting because they're trying to protect the joints. The next thing that's going to happen is that person is going to actually damage the joints. The same thing happens in the mouth. If somebody's got a malocclusion and they don't clench their teeth, who cares? Because the only time teeth should ever touch is when you swallow and then very lightly. Go ahead and do that. Swallow. And teeth should only touch when you swallow and then very lightly. As you go through the day, you should not have your teeth clamped together. They shouldn't be touching. When you eat food, the teeth should not touch. A good way to position your teeth as you go through the day is to hum. Mm. And that puts your lips together and your teeth apart. So lips together, teeth apart is the proper position of the teeth and the jaws as you go through the day. You'll find it interesting that it's impossible to tense the master medial pterygoid and temporalis muscles if you don't have your teeth together. Try it. First put your teeth together and squeeze. You know those muscles? They're really tight. Now put your teeth apart and try to tense those muscles. You can't do it. 
unless you put your teeth together, you can't tense those muscles. So when someone comes into your office and these muscles are just tight and rigid, what do you know they're doing? They're clenching their teeth, either by day or by night or both, because you can't put pressure on those muscles unless you put your teeth together. Now, this is a very unstable bite. If the first contact in centriculation is only on the distal of the second molar teeth, especially on one side, that's like having a leg shorter than the other. Because the objective of ideal occlusion is to have contact from the mesial of the first molar through the cuspid tooth on both sides with just light contact on the second molar and the distal of the first molar. And you should be able to pull shim stock between the four anterior teeth when the patient closes together. Now it's okay if the second molar tooth and the distal of the first molar tooth as well as the incisor teeth contact at the same time as the cuspids, bicuspids, and mesial of the first molar. But you never want the second molar or the distal of the first molar or the incisor teeth to contact prior to the cuspids, bicuspids, and mesial of the first molar. Now this is an unstable bite. You've got a good solid centric occlusion, but you have a slide so that when the teeth are in maximum intercuspation, the condyle is pulled forward because remember the teeth are connected to the mandible, which is connected to the condyle. So the position of the teeth when the teeth hit and skid, whatever's happening with the teeth is also gonna be happening with the condyle. So the objective is for the teeth not to slide when the condyle is seated maximally. This is not stable. One of the worst occlusions you can have is first contact on the anterior teeth. This is especially true in patients with deep bites because what that does, it retrudes the mandible or the condyle into the retrodiscal tissue. This can put a patient to bed. If they bite together, say a, pa a dentist puts crowns on the upper front teeth or a bridge on the lower anterior teeth, and he says, how's that feel? Well, the patient's ready to get out of your office. And there's premature contact. Every time they squeeze together, it distalizes the condyle into that retrodiscal tissue and can just really mess them up. Also, remember, you have to check the occlusion with the patient sitting up in the alert feeding position. Because if you only check the occlusion with the patient sitting backward, the mandible comes forward about a half a millimeter in what's called the alert feeding position. That's when they're sitting up in the chair. So it's very important that you check the anterior contacts in that alert feeding position and be sure there's no premature contact on the central and lateral incisor teeth. Now, this is a pretty stable inclusion right here. If you only have the cuspid teeth contacting with the condyle seated, the posterior teeth will super erupt if they're not contacting, but that is a very stable and comfortable occlusion if just the cuspid teeth are contacting with the condyle maximally seated. But you don't want to leave it like that because teeth, rot teeth uh, erupt until they contact something. So this, these are the tenets of ideal occlusion. Bone braced condyles in the fossa. That means the condyles are seated as maximally as they can be seated. Now, if you have a hard time manipulating into centric relation, just put that compound between the front teeth and have the patient put their tongue back in the roof of their mouth and just tap on to the compound between the front teeth or onto a flat plane. And the condyle will go up the eminence into the maximally seated position of the fossa. If you just put a flat piece of acrylic on the front teeth, uh, put acrylic on the, the upper incisor teeth with just a flat plane so that the mandibular anterior teeth are just tapping into that with the tongue and the roof of the mouth as far back as it'll go. And that condyle will go up the eminence into the maximally seated position and that's very comfortable and stable. Maximum intercuspation of teeth. Have enough teeth contacting simultaneously on right and left 
that it's stable, just like the table in the restaurant. All the teeth don't have to contact simultaneously, but you don't want an individual tooth contacting prior to the stable contact of multiple teeth, but that's, that's a stable occlusal plane. No CRCO slide. What that means is with the condyle seated maximally in the fossa, when you touch the patient's teeth together like this, and then have them squeeze, there should be no perceptible slide. So when I touch the patient's teeth together with the condyle seated in centric relation, the patient should feel bilateral simultaneous contact of the teeth. And when they squeeze, there should be no perceptible slide from centric relation to centric occlusion. The teeth should be stable. There should be no change from when the teeth are contacting in centric relation to where they're contacting in centric occlusion. The eccentric movements are on the anterior teeth, cuspid to cuspid, extending possibly to the bicuspid teeth on the working side if group function is desired. That sounds complicated, but it's easy. Go back to the Williamson and Lundquist study. When posterior teeth are not contacting, 80% of the muscle fibers don't fire. So when you move left and right, you want those movements to be on the most anterior teeth because the fewest number of muscle fibers are firing. Now if you're moving left and right and you're hitting on your molar teeth, there's, you're going to have maximum muscle fibers firing and you're much more likely to fracture a tooth. The cuspid teeth and the incisor teeth are, de are designed or eccentric movements. The cusps are designed that way. The roots are designed that way. I mean, the cuspid roots, you know what it's like to extract a cuspid. And so the further forward, if you can move the eccentric movements to the cuspids and the anterior teeth, that's the best. If you have a weakened cuspid, sometimes you want group function on the bicuspid teeth to help that cuspid. Only on the working side. Now remember, you don't ever want balancing side contacts. Maybe sometimes if somebody had just had a big anterior open bite, but generally speaking, you don't want balancing side contacts. You don't want contacts on the opposite side from the direction the mandible is moving. Remember, working side is the direction the mandible is moving. If it's moving to the right, sliding to the right, the working side is the right side, and the balancing side is the left side. So when the mandible is moving to the right, you don't want any teeth on the left to contact. <clears throat> when the mandible is moving to the left, you don't want any teeth on the right to contact. And when the mandible is moving to the left or the right, you want the anterior teeth to be the teeth contacting, if at all possible, unless there's a big anterior open bite. You want to remove all the working side and balancing side contacts from the molar teeth for sure, and from the bicuspid teeth, unless you're protecting a weak cuspid, then you may have what's called a group function. That means when you move to the right, the cuspid and maybe the first bicuspid could even be the second bicuspid contact. What's the problem with that? As posterior teeth contact, more muscle fibers are firing. So you may not have the full 100%, but if you've got bicuspid teeth contacting as you move the mandible to the right side, you're going to have probably twice as many muscle fibers firing in that movement as you would if just the cuspid tooth contacted. Yeah, no balancing side contacts. Balancing side, as I said, is the opposite side from the side the mandible is moving. So if the mandible is moving to the right, you don't want any contacts on the left side at all. If the mandible's moving to the left, sliding to the left, you don't want any contacts on the right teeth at all. Centric occlusion contacts between the incisors is slightly lighter than contacts between the cuspids and molars. That means when the patient bites down, you should be able to pull shim stock, which is one one thousandth of an inch, between the lateral and the central incisors. Why do you want to be able to do that when they squeeze together? Because you want to be sure that you don't have a premature contact on the incisor teeth that would distalize the mandible. The only way you can be sure of that 
is if you can pull shim stock between the laterals and the centrals when the patient squeezes together. Now it may, it may, those teeth may super erupt just a tiny little bit over time so that they are contacting, but by ensuring that you can pull that shim stock through when the patient squeezes together, you know that there's no premature contact on those incisor teeth that's distalizing the mandible. And no posterior teeth contact before the cuspids in central crelation occlusion. That means you don't want the second molars or the distal or the first molar to contact before the cuspids and the bicuspids in centric relation occlusion, also called CRO. In summation, let's go through the fundamentals of occlusion. You'd like the maximum number of teeth on the side, cuspids through bicuspids and mesial of first molar, to contact simultaneously when the condyles are maximally seated. When the patient moves left and right and forward, in a perfect world, you'd like all those contacts to be on the anterior teeth from cuspid to cuspid. It's called cuspid protected working side occlusion. And you slide to the right, all that movement's on the cuspid and then it transfers to the incisor teeth. Occasionally, you'll have bicuspids in working side contact to protect a weakened cuspid. We don't want any contacts on the teeth on the side opposite the direction the mandible's moving, meaning if the mandible's moving to the right, you don't want any contacts on the left teeth at all. If it's moving to the left, you don't want any contacts on the right teeth at all. When the patient moves forward, into protrusive, ideally those contacts are on the central incisors because those are the most anterior teeth. Sometimes that does, if there's a little anterior open bite or a class two occlusion, those contacts may be on the cuspid teeth. That's okay, but you're going to pick up more muscle fibers as you go distally, as more teeth toward the posterior contact. So what that creates is a very stable, stable occlusion and then give most patients a night guard to wear at night and the night guards I fabricate will go through that. We've done that in other dental minutes. Is a flat plane hard acrylic uh, appliance in which only the anterior teeth contact in centric relation occlusion. There are no posterior contacts. And some of you are going to say, oh my gosh, those posterior teeth are going to super erupt. No, it takes 24 to 48 hours for teeth to move at all. So as long as the patient's not wearing that appliance all the time, it's, it's fine. And so when they're grinding at night, they're bruxing at night, only about 15% of the muscle fibers will be firing. It's going to make uh, the muscles of the face feel a whole lot better. So there we have it. That's occlusion. These procedures work, and they work every time.